tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into this program. I've got Dr. Paul Copan with us. We met him at ETS this year. Uh, very excited to have him on the show today talking about uh, his book is God of Indictive Bullet, but he's also written quite a bit of stuff on the subject uh, when it comes to things like slavery, when it comes to things like the Canaanite extinction, when it comes to like those hard, difficult passages where, man, we have this gracious and long-suffering and merciful God, and yet there are these moments of judgment, there are these moments of wrath where God steps in and does some stuff. He makes wrong things right. He brings justice uh, in some meaningful way, and, and Paul has been able to navigate those waters in a way that, that I think uh, lends credibility to the inspiration and authority and infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture, but also paints God as both righteous and just and not this you know, immoral uh, object of wrath that's just constantly snapping, um, bringing down hellfire on the bad guys. So uh, I really enjoy Paul's work and I'm excited to introduce you to his program. But if you are new to the, the show and you're like, hey, I, I've i never seen a podcast that interviews a bunch of people from different uh, denominations and churches and that kind of thing, uh, check out the, the subscription down below. You can uh, click to our newsletter and get notified when we come out with uh, content just like this, when we come out with study guides on subjects like this, uh, past interviews that might be interesting to you, uh, future conferences that we're doing, courses that we release, discounts, all kinds of great stuff can be found in that newsletter. So we encourage you to just subscribe to the newsletter, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, and without further ado, uh, I want to introduce Josh, your, uh, your voice just it, like... It, disappeared stop making sound i'm sorry when i cut to the three shot camera it muted me so uh what i was going to say is i want to introduce you to my co-host there on the left that's michael ranchio and then paul uh is there on the right before we introduce paul uh michael you want to tell us a little about i don't know the show what you're excited about just, just talk about things yeah, yeah say things yeah, say sure. words michael sure. say words <laughs> uh i'm excited about this episode it's a good topic we talked with uh, dr john wallace about it earlier in the year and uh and we're talking about it john again and paul John, what did I say? Walton, whatever. You said Wallace. Anyway, um, yeah, so you guys can go back and check out that episode as well. And uh, I think uh, Josh and I are probably going to have more alignment with Paul on this episode. So uh, always eager for those episodes that I'm more likely to agree with. <laughs> but here at Remnant Radio, we, we interview all kinds and so uh, that we agree and disagree with. So Paul, excited to have you on the show. And uh, maybe we could just start out like this, if you could. Just introduce us to yourself, some of the things that you've written, and uh, and your ministry. I appreciate it. Well, I'm glad to be with you. I uh, am a professor at Palm Beach Atlantic University in our MA Philosophy of Religion program. Uh, so Paul Gould and Brenda Rickabaugh, fellow philosophers who are teaching that program, so come join us. Uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, we uh, you know, also, at uh, in terms of my own ministry, I, I Basically, it's through the school that I teach, uh, where I have speaking opportunities and so forth. So it's not, uh, you know, Paul Copan Ministries or something like that. But uh, but just I'm often asked to speak on university campuses or at conferences or in churches uh, or at various uh, other settings. And so I uh, engage in talking largely about Old Testament ethical challenges. And I mean, I have written in the area of philosophy of religion, apologetics, uh, theology, and so forth. But uh, it seems like since my book, uh, Is God a Moral Monster, came out, uh, that's been the dominant theme that people have asked me to speak on. I've done another book, uh, co-authored that with Matthew Flanagan, called Did God Really Command Genocide? And then the third book in that series uh, is called uh, Is God a Vindictive Bully? And I look at the uh, the God uh, of the Old Testament as portrayed, and is this in contradiction to the God of the New Testament? And so I'm interacting with a lot of uh, th thinkers like Greg Boyd and Randall Rouser and uh, Peter Enns and others who uh, who take a different view uh, that looks like they're they're talking about, they're talking about two different uh, uh, understandings of God: the the textual God and the actual God. 
and uh, I contest that uh, that sort of representation. But anyway, I, I do work in, like I said, in apologetics, uh, philosophy of religion, uh, theology. Uh, but uh, but again, we're here to talk about the themes, and my book is God of Vindictive Bully. So looking forward to jumping in. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and give us your, your time today. I know it's valuable. Maybe start with, uh, you mentioned some of the, the reasons that we need to engage with this content. Um, I've noticed that there, and you've mentioned this in your book, there are enemies on the outside, and it seems at times that maybe there are even enemies within. Uh, can you maybe lie, like outline why that is the case? Like, why, why do we, why, who is this book for? Like these books that you're writing for, it's, it's speaking specifically to these ethical issues, but why do we have to do that? It, you know, the, these guys on the outside saying things about the Christian faith and people on the inside kind of pulling apart the Christian faith. Could you maybe weigh in on some of that and, and why it's important for Christians to familiarize themselves with this kind of material? material uh, and, and, and your thoughts on the enemies on the out and the enemies within. Right. Yeah, I, I do try to tackle the, I call them critics from without people like Richard Dawkins and uh, Daniel Dennett and other uh, atheistic critics who are talking against the God of the Old Testament. As Richard Dawkins says that the God of the Old Testament is the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. And I try to respond to a number of those objections, both in my Moral Monster book and also here. But, uh, and so there are people who, who are attacking the severity of God. And, uh, and so what I'm trying to do is say, hold on, there is the kindness of God that needs to be represented here. As Paul says in Romans eleven twenty two. 22, behold then the kindness and the severity of God. Uh, but they, then you have critics from within, theologians, biblical scholars who uh, who say that the Old Testament God is this primitive, barbaric uh, God represented by these fallen ancient Near Eastern prophets or uh, narrators. And when it says, thus says the Lord, it doesn't necessarily mean that the actual God is speaking. That just could be the fallen uh, authors or narrators representation of what he takes to be God. So watch out if it says, thus says the Lord. It may not necessarily be the Lord, but just the faulty representation of God by this uh, ancient Near Eastern author who is violence prone, uh, who is fallen and, uh, and sinful and so forth. So I'm pushing back against that to, uh, to challenge people who are uh, undermining the integrity of the representation of God in the Old Testament and following basically the pattern of the New Testament interpreters that they're not making this kind of distinction between the actual God and the textual God that, uh, and, and, and people like Greg Boyd, they, they want to talk about the cruciform uh, view of God. And, and I'm all about cruciformity, don't get me wrong. But what Greg Boyd does is he takes as his starting point Jesus on the cross when he's saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And as though this is all that we have to consider about Jesus, who, of course, reveals the Father. But there are a lot of texts that are ignored in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, so some of the severe aspects of Jesus that are totally uh, ignored or judgments in the Old Testament that are affirmed in the New Testament. But again, these are not picked up on by Greg Boyd in his, uh, in his book, The Crucifixion of the Warrior God. 1,400 pages of, uh, of stuff in there. But as you look at the index, I kept on looking up these texts. Nope. Not in there, not in there. What, what, how does Greg Boyd deal with this? Nope, not in there, not in there. So, so I'm trying to push back on some of these challenges that are coming from inside the church because Greg Boyd, he wants to emphasize the kindness of God, and we ought to, but uh, downplay the severity of God. But both of these are aspects of the actual God, and it's not just the, severe, the severity of God that is part of the textual God. And so I'm pushing back uh, on, this, on that theme and trying to expose some of the cherry picking that's going on from those who are, the, as I call them, critics from within the church who want to say unhitch, uh, as Andy Stanley has said, to unhitch the Old Testament from the new. Okay. So several times you've mentioned the textual God versus the actual God. Um, some of our viewers haven't read your books. And so could you maybe dive into those a little bit more and define precisely what you mean by each and maybe the different positions, your position versus the position of, yeah. uh, of those who are arguing for those distinctions? Sure. 
Yeah, the like I said, I'm, I'm taking the verse from Romans eleven twenty two. Behold, then the kindness and severity of God. And as I said, the critics from outside the church, the atheists like Richard Dawkins, they'll emphasize how God is severe, but they'll ignore the full representation of the kindness of God in the scriptures. Uh, and then you have, on the other hand, the critics from within the church, people like Greg Boyd and Peter Enns and Randall Rouser and so forth. And they are emphasizing the kindness of God, turn the other cheek, Jesus who is saying, Father, forgive them, love your enemies and so forth, that that is the actual God. And that's whenever there is this, uh, you know, God is bringing judgment through, say, maybe striking someone down uh, to death, like Uzzah or the like, uh, the critics from within, Greg Boyd and so forth, will say that is not the actual God acting. That is a that is the maybe a uh, a demonic power that is active, uh, or or a prophet who is misusing his divine power uh, to strike someone down. But that's not the actual God. That's just the uh, the you know that's just representing the textual God of the fallen, violence prone, ancient Near Eastern author. Or prophet. So if we're looking at the actual God, as Greg Boyd says, is revealed in Jesus Christ, and of course I believe that Jesus Christ reveals the, the one true God, but uh, it's again, er, it, it's emphasizing the, the, the kindness, turn the other cheek, uh, not, uh, you know, not uh, striking down your enemies and so forth, those who are opposing uh, the prophets and so forth. So, so the actual God, kindness, Lo kind, loving, merciful, and so forth, not striking people dead, uh, not that severe God. And so that's the representation. Textual God is the false representation of God in the Old and sometimes the New Testament too. Uh, Paul will sometimes misrepresent uh, uh, who the, the one true God is and so on. Uh, but, uh, but basically the textual God is the faulty, fallen, violence prone representation of God by this ancient Near Eastern or ancient author. And what we want to focus on is the, 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 the cruciform understanding of God, Jesus dying for his enemies and so forth. That's the actual God. And what I'm trying to do is say that these two are to be brought together, kindness and severity, and that the downplaying of the severity of God actually gives to us a skewed picture of God who is represented as gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding, abounding in loving kindness and faithfulness, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished, that God is one who will bring justice, who will avenge, say, those martyrs in Revelation chapter 6, uh, whose blood has been shed by those who dwell upon the earth. And so the martyrs are not fallen, they're in heaven under the altar, uh, and they are calling on God to, to bring justice, uh, to do what God promised to do, namely to, uh, to, uh, to render to everyone according to his deeds. And, and so that's one of the texts, for example, that Greg Boyd doesn't, doesn't address. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's the textual God, actual God. So feel free to follow up with any questions. Well, yeah, I'll follow up and I'd be curious both on the critics on the outside, the critics on the inside when it comes to the new atheist or or the Greg Boyd types. They would go to verses in the Old Testament. You mentioned quite a few of them. You know, uh, slavery is kind of instituted in Scripture. It's talked about through the Mosaic law. Uh, genocide, commanding to slay Canaanites, right? All of them, men, women, and children, the whole bit. Uh, plagues, right? Fire and brimstone they would say these are enough to show, the atheists would say these are enough to show that your God is this angry bully, he is this moral monster, he is a bad guy. Why are you following this God? We know in our modern sensibilities, slavery is wrong. Uh, and if he's instituting this, therefore he's wrong, he's, he's immoral. Uh, we know genocide is wrong. So if God is instituting this, then, then, then your God is immoral. Now on the the, the, the critics from within, their response to those texts of scripture is to say, well, they say that, 
but that wasn't really God saying those things. That was that was just our best interpretation of God saying those things, which certainly undermines sufficiency and inerrancy and those kinds of things of the scripture. Um, however, I just kind of toss that over to you. Um, what do we do with texts like that, with critics on the outside, critics on the inside saying, uh, we either have misunderstood God entirely or he's a bad guy. H- how do you engage with those, you know, proof texts? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's interesting to note that these people like Greg Boyd would agree with Richard Dawkins that the textual God of the Old Testament is the most unpleasant character in all fiction. So they would, so people like Greg Boyd would just say, yeah, I totally agree with you, That, but that's not the true God, as, as you were saying. But uh, what I would want to do is push back on some of the representations of say, what is involved in, quote, slavery. And I go into a lot of detail in my books, but especially, most especially kind of refining a few things in uh, Is God a Vindictive Bully by highlighting that what when you read slavery or slave in the Old Testament, this is far different from what is going on in, say, the antebellum South, uh, where there, where the slave has no rights. He can be beaten to death. Uh, If he runs away, he's got to be returned and brought back to his harsh master because he is his property and so forth. And as we compare that sort of a scenario to what's going on in ancient Israel, and even foreigners who are servants in Israel, it is a far different picture. We see the humanity of the servant, and I think that servant is a better term than the, than the term slave, uh, just because it, well, one, slave often connotes that the person has no rights, that this person is, is merely property. Uh, but we also see, uh, you know, that uh, there is a, you know, like even in a lot of our modern versions, they, they don't seem to filter very well the language of slavery because it, it conjures up uh, all kinds of associations with the antebellum South, with the, the harshness of uh, treatment of human beings like Frederick Douglass and his, and his you know, family and so forth. So, uh, so anyway, there are a number of issues to be taken right there. So first qualifying what we mean by servitude. And, and I'll give you an example from uh, Exodus 21. It says that if a, a servant is struck so that he dies, then he is to be avenged. And that's the language that's typically used for capital punishment. So we're not dealing with someone who is just a piece of furniture that's been broken. Uh, We're talking about a human being who has been harmed and that there is capital punishment that comes along with that. I spent three chapters on uh, foreign servants in uh, in Israel, uh, namely you know, Leviticus 25 in particular, where I unpack this text and show that, yeah, it talks about, oh, you may acquire foreign servants. Well, yes, you may acquire foreign servants, just as you may acquire an Israelite servant. In fact, the one who is the sojourner who is living among you, whom you may acquire as a servant, Leviticus says, people don't read further where it says that if this foreigner who is an alien and sojourning among you, if he becomes a person of means or he prospers, that person may actually take on an Israelite servant to work for him. So it doesn't mean that you're stuck in that particular position. You would actually rise and better yourself. And so a lot of the language that's used of foreign servants in Israel is the same language that's used of other Israelite servants who also may be, quote, acquired, but clearly their humanity is understood. They have term limits in terms of how long to uh, you can keep them as a contracted worker, like an indentured servant, and so forth. So that those are just a few things to hit on in the, uh, in the area of servitude. Uh, so, so again, pushing back against the very emotive language and trying to bring clarity to this issue. And uh, we, again, come back to that if you like. But when it comes to what, what about the passages where it says man, woman, young, and old? Well, the, the more I dig, the more I see that this language is strongly hyperbolic. This is part of what we would call the uh, ancient Near Eastern trash talk 
uh, kind of like our sports jargon, where we we talk about, oh, we totally destroyed that team. We totally annihilated those guys. Well, we don't take that literally. And, and in the ancient Near East, that kind of language about warfare was not taken literally. Uh, you can have that sweeping language, but have lots of survivors. The term haram, sometimes translated utterly destroy. When you look closely, you see actually there's not utter destruction going on. Sometimes it just means exile. For example, God in, in Jeremiah 25, uh, 9 through 11 says that he is going to, quote, utterly destroy the people of Judah. Well, what does that mean? Well, they're going to go into exile. And the language talks about leaving their cities to be an everlasting, an everlasting desolation. But how long is that everlasting desolation to last? Well, 70 years. So, and then the people come back. So, and again, it's exile. It's not wiping out the, the people of Judah. Uh, we can talk about other texts that people will often uh, point to. I'll, I'll give you two examples. In Numbers 21, we have these two Amorite kings who are rising up and fighting against the Israelites. The Israelites want to pass through peacefully and don't want to provoke anybody. They just ask permission to go through. And so, uh, so these two kings rise up. Instead of letting them pass through, they fight against them. And it says that, that these kings are going out to battle, out to fight them, the king, his sons, and his army. So clearly, we're dealing with a, uh, a bunch of combatants rather than non-combatants, men, you know, just kind of you know, women, children, the elderly, and so forth. They're just not there. Uh, not when they're being attacked. You're not going to bring women and el the elderly to attack uh, the Israelites uh, to fight against them. And not to mention, you've got this this long uh, long hike from the you know, you know between the two rivers in Moab, uh, which again you know, it's, a, it's like an all night journey that these soldiers go on. So obviously, children, elderly aren't going to be part of this this long trek uh, that these soldiers are taking. Fast forward to Deuteronomy chapters two and three, where this battle is recounted. Remember the original context; it talks about the king, his sons, his army, basically combatants. Well, Deuteronomy ramps up the rhetorical language. If you compare it to Exodus, to Numbers, and so forth, the same language that's used is now, you know, then show no mercy, uh, you know, leave alive nothing that breathes, and so forth. So it intensifies the language. And the language is also, that same intensive language is applied to that battle that took place in Numbers 21, but in, in Deuteronomy, it says, man, woman, young and old, it's using that sweeping, exaggerated language, even though there weren't any women or children or elderly in that battle scene. We can I take on another example. Uh, the passage where, which is like seen as the paradigmatic passage, uh, the Amalekites in 1 Samuel 15, where it's set, where again, picking up on that rhetorical language, uh, you know, the Lord tells Samuel to tell Saul to, quote, utterly destroy the Amalekites, man, woman, young and old. Well, what's going on here? Well, a couple of things. First of all, in chapter 14, the chapter preceding in verse 48, it talks about how the Amalekites had come in and raided the Israelites. So they're already the provocateurs. And uh, so what happens next? Well, the Israelites are going to fight against the Amalekites. So there's a city in, uh, you know, a, a citadel, a city, it's called a city of Amalek in verse 5 of 1 Samuel 15. And it says that they're going to fight a battle there, but there's a group of people who are friendly to the Israelites. They're called the Kenites. And Saul sends word to the Kenites who are with the Amalekites saying, we're going to fight against the Amalekites. Our, our beef is not with you. So you can, you know, just please go on. We don't want you to get involved in the fray. Obviously, there aren't going to be women and children hanging around there if they know that there's going to be a pitched battle that's going to be taking place. So the Kenites leave, and then Saul attacks that city. And it, it uses that language of man, woman, young and old, and so forth. And the narrator says that Saul used that term haram, quote, utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Well, interestingly, we keep reading in that same book. At the end, we read that David is fighting against whom? 
the army of the Amalekites. So they're still there. They weren't literally utterly destroyed, that they are still lingering. The word haram simply just meant a victory, that the, that the Israelites had been victorious, and that's the extent of it. Uh, so, so the narrator in 1 Samuel 15 says that Saul, quote, utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But here they are at the end of the book, still uh, larger than life, as it were. And so David ends up defeating them. And there's this kind of language that's used as part of the exaggeration technique, where uh, in the first instance, Saul fought them from Arabia to Egypt. And then David fights them all the way to Egypt as well. Again, this is vast, massive territory. But again, this is typical language that was used in the ancient Near East where you have a localized battle. And then it mentions universal conquest. This was just part of the rhetorical uh, device that was used uh, in warfare language. So those are a few instances where even though it uses this sweeping language, when you look more closely, those same people that were allegedly utterly destroyed, where there are no survivors, say in the book of Joshua, you read about them sometimes in the same chapter, sometimes a couple of chapters later, or you come to them in Judges chapter one, and we read the Israelites could not drive them out. They could not drive them out. They could not drive them out and so forth. So there's that repetition where it looks like it's a sweeping total, uh, you know, total wipeout. But then we see kind of the realistic picture on the ground in a place like Judges chapter one, or even at the end of Jer uh, at the end of Joshua, where Joshua, even though there's peace, there's rest in the land, Joshua goes on to say, but there are many other nations that need, be, need to be driven out and so forth. So that's the type of thing that we need to take into consideration, the, that kind of hyperbolic language that is being utilized. Anyway, those are a few things to uh, talk about, but feel free to jump in. Sure. Fantastic. Sure. So, thank, yeah, thank you for that. So, um, I'm just imagine. Let, let's say that we grant everything that you said. Like, hey, this was not a full scale genocide. There was a lot of hyperbolic type of stuff going on. Uh, it seems that you are still conceding that God does say to do things like drive people out of their homes. Uh, God does say, maybe even God says, kill some or not all, if not all, but like even just like go kill some or go kill one, right? Like, I mean, of course he tells Abraham, go kill your son, but you know, then the whole story plays out and God says, uh, actually don't kill him, right? But, but still that picture of a God, like even if it's not a full scale genocide, how would you respond to the critic who wants to say it's still bad? It's still bad that he's like, uh, I, I mean, just imagine, so I live in Oklahoma City and, and you know, some group of people say, God told me to drive you out of your home. And like, that would be terrible. So how would you deal with that? Like, you're, you're just dealing with the scale of it, but the core and kernel of the issues remains. How would you respond to someone who, yeah. uh, who pushes back like that? Right. A couple of things. Let me just uh, go back to the uh, the warfare question. Uh, keep in mind that, for example, the the battles against the Canaanites in the city, you know, like in the various cities that are mentioned. These and Richard Hess uh, talks at length about this in in his writings. Uh, he's at Denver Seminary, uh, Old Testament scholar, ancient Near Eastern uh, scholar, and he talks about how these cities of the ancient Near East. Uh, that are to be where the Israelites are called to drive them out. These are citadels. These are military and administrative centers, which are not places where civilians are hanging out. Uh, they are in kind of the more removed area, kind of in the in the hill countries and so forth, in the hill country, uh, but not in those cities. You might have an occasional uh, person like a Rahab, uh, but basically we're dealing with uh, you know, administrators. You've got a king, Melech, uh, who is the is like the the the, the leader of the army. Uh, and and so you but but so these are strategic military citadels and and storage places administrative centers, uh, but they're not where civilians hang out. So that's that's something to be con to, to consider. Uh, when it comes to the the matter of say okay, let's take Abraham. Uh, I do talk about this in my book, uh, Is God a Moral Monster, where I talk about how when you're looking at the command of God. And you contrast this with somebody who says, hey, the Lord told me to drive, to drive you out of your home or the Lord told me to kill my son. Well, how is that different? Well, 
there's a huge difference. For one thing, God has been in communication with Abraham for decades. There has been a friendship that has been developing. God makes a covenant with Abraham. And who is at the heart of that covenant? Isaac, his son, a miracle child. God says, you're going to have a child from both your bodies, though you're older, uh, you know, you're know, you past childbearing. The miracle is going to be that you both will be uh, will bring a child into this world. And so this miracle child then is going to be that promised child through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And when God commands Abraham to take his one and only son, by the way, he's probably is, you know, Isaac's probably a teenager who can carry uh, carry the wood for the for the offering and so forth. Probably could have overpowered Abraham, uh, but again, he uh, submits to this. He knowing that he's the promised child. But even before they go, Abraham says, "We will go and worship, and we will return." Abraham knows that somehow God is going to bring Isaac back from the dead or that Isaac is somehow going to evade uh, death in the first place. And so there is no, uh, you know, that there is no issue in terms of Isaac's longevity. He is going to bring, you know, he's going to have offspring. And through that offspring, there will be blessing that comes to all the nations. So, so this is a far different picture than someone who says, oh, the Lord told me last night to do this. The, the, that totally rips the picture out of the Abrahamic narrative. Look at the bigger picture. Look and see how God has been involved. Look and see how Isaac is the promised child. This is, a, you know, and, and the, the actions that are commanded by God are in that are embedded within that context and so if these are part of the facts surrounding that act that totally changes the picture of of what abraham is about to do so so it, it requires some nuancing and finessing that this is not just like any other act this is something that's taking place in biblical history god has made promises he's going to make good on those promises abraham trusts in god and he sees how that promise is fulfilled that abraham uh you know will see his son carrying on and that he will he will live and again be the father uh, of, uh, of of nations and the blessing uh, to to the ends of the earth that's great I, I'm curious with the maybe moving for a moment just from solely the Old Testament and specifically looking at the critics from within the critics from within want to pit, I mean, they're like Neo-Marcians. They want to pit Jesus against the God of the Old Testament as if they're two separate beings. And they'll say that there is this kind of Christiform hermeneutic that helps us really figure out which verses in the Old Testament and, and frankly, the New Testament um, have to do with actually the spirit of Jesus. Now, this might sound confusing for people. So I have put together this very informative graph to show what the cruciform hermeneutic is, okay? Uh, step one, okay. Uh, the cruciform hermeneutic shows us the heart of Jesus. Step two, we should use Jesus's crucifixion to criticize the Bible. Step three, we may even have to criticize the Bible's presentation of Jesus in the light of the spirit of Jesus. And then finally, I determine which texts in the Bible demonstrate the true spirit of Jesus. Okay, that's a little tongue in cheek. I, I apologize, guys. Um, it, it, it's silly because it is one of those things. Listening where it's like, on audio, use... you got to go watch back and and check the video. Yeah, you got to go back there. if you're watching the podcast. It's it's a it's a funny graphic. Anyway, you you have to go to the New Testament and say, well, because of the cross, that interprets everything I know about God. You know, old, new. I, I'm just going to rewrite everything based off of this one moment, this crucifixion. But you also have to acknowledge that that crucifixion was written by morally corrupt people like jesus didn't grab a bible and write down the story perfectly right he he used the dual inspiration of the work of the spirit and luke and matthew and mark and john to tell this grand narrative in the same way that he inspired the story of the crucifixion he inspired the story through paul and through moses and through all these old testament prophets so it, it's such a frustrating um a frustrating system where Jesus is used to weaponize against 
the God that he's always been. You know, Paul, you know, I, I use crayons to, to explain the cruciform hermeneutic. Could you maybe uh, take a moment to explain what the cruciform hermeneutic is and how it is really inconsistent? Because even in the New Testament, Jesus is portrayed as one who brings judgment and correction and discipline and wrath. So could you maybe take a moment and unpack that for us? Sure. Yeah, the portrayal, uh, you know, and again, some people might, you know, uh, you know, I think maybe Greg Boyd might quibble with your third point, where you know, the New Testament writers are perhaps falsely representing Jesus, at least in the Gospels. And I think Greg Boyd would say, well, no, I think the, the Gospels are giving to us uh, the, the accurate picture, but there may be some other things like Peter when he uh, when he strikes down Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, you know, this will not be an instance of divine judgment, uh, but actually it's a misuse of Peter's you know, uh, apostolic power, or it's a, it's a, it's a demonic uh, attack uh, where God withdraws his presence and demonic or you know, human agents uh, will will take over, and they will they will misuse their power uh, to to do terrible things. Uh, or uh, or you know, you know the imprecatory psalms, for example. Greg Boyd will say those from the Old Testament. These are anti-gospel. These are uh, these go against the spirit of the gospel. Well, what's interesting is that the Apostle Paul in Romans eleven and Peter in Acts chapter one. They actually quote imprecatory psalms. Well, Greg Boyd says, well, Paul was wrong. He, he was basically he is reflecting his own fallen and uh, corrupt humanity when he is talking about the, you know, that, that God is going to uh, basically break the backs of the Israelites and, and, and blind them and so forth, uh, that that is not uh, an appropriate use of, you know, appropriate, that's not a gospel use of the Old Testament. Again, uh, we see the imprecatory psalms utilized in several places, including Peter when he says in Acts chapter one, uh, you know, let his home be made desolate, let another take his office. Well, those are, again, two imprecatory psalms represented right there, and they're not anti-gospel. And I think the more you probe with this, uh, you know, the, you know, you're trying to get this cruciform narrative, and 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 and, and we ha basically have a God who uh, who sacrifices Himself, a God who gives His very life and and prays for His enemies at the end. That's cruciformity. That's that's the gospel there. Well, yes, that is imp an important feature of the gospel. But what about other features of Jesus? Things that are say in red letters that Jesus is saying. And that actually reflects something a bit different than how Greg Boyd is portraying it. So let me give you a few examples. Jesus is routinely telling parables about wicked you know, vineyard tenants or uh, you know, wicked slaves, etc., and who, who are not obeying the master or the king who's gone away and so forth. And so when he comes back, Jesus uses a language, you know, what do you think he'll do? He's gonna cut them in pieces and so forth. Well, Greg Boyd says that's actually not what Jesus means because that's you can have things that are correct in a parable and things that are off kilter in a parable, things that are a bit skewed like an unjust judge uh, or an unjust steward and so forth in Luke 16. So, so what are we to make of, of this? Well, Jesus will, you know, it's interesting that Jesus is routinely portraying the ruler as someone who is gonna come back and deal severely with those who have neglected their responsibilities, who have shirked their responsibilities, who have repudiated the authority of the king or the owner of the vineyard. And so there is that strong language of judgment against them. In fact, in Luke 18, where there is the parable of the unforgiving servant, Jesus, after he's done with the parable, then offers his commentary about you know, this man being handed over to the torturers. And it says, so will my heavenly father do to you, to anyone who does not forgive his brother from his heart. So Jesus is offering this commentary of a great severity that, this, that God is not just kind and loving and merciful, but also part of that picture is the divine severity that uh, again, get, often gets overlooked. And Greg says, oh, you know, God wouldn't torture people. You know, God wouldn't do that. So torture, that's, that's just, you know, we got to do something else with that. But again, a very severe statement here. Or jump to 
uh, you know, to Jesus talking about how in, in Matthew 18, 6, where someone who leads one of these little ones astray, it'd be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Or Jesus talking about capital punishment in the Old Testament in Matthew 15, where if someone goes against the word of God, the commandment of God, then, you know, like, uh, like you know, cursing his father and mother, that there could be this potential death penalty of, you know, against that person. And so Jesus saying that that was part of the command of God, that that was a severe command that was given by God. Greg Boyd says, this is Jesus just being ironic and so forth. Well, keep going to the book of Hebrews, where in chapter two, that, you know, that, there is, you know, that there is this judgment that comes by those who violate the law. In fact, in chapter 10, the book of Hebrews says that, you know, that if, if someone were put to death and because of the witness of two or three persons, how much more severe will it be for those who turn their backs on God, who, those who apostatize and so forth? So, so if anything, the the new testament is ramping up the severity rather than toning it down saying oh that was bad back then that was that was misrepresentation of the true character of god here the new testament is saying if you repudiate these things then then the, then the judgment is more severe jesus does the same sort of thing when he's talking about the cities of his own day that would be more tolerable for uh you know for S S tyre and sidon and sodom then for Bethsaida and Chorazin of Jesus' day, because if the miracles performed in you know, these cities had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they'd have repented in sackcloth and ashes. So Jesus is ramping it up and saying, it's gonna be much more severe for you because here, someone like, Sol someone greater than Solomon or the, you know, the, you know, you know, the queen of Sheba or so forth, you know, far greater than Solomon and you're repudiating this messenger. So anyway, those are some of the things that we could talk about, but I'll, I'll finish with this. In Jude 5, our best New Testament manuscripts read this Christological understanding of the Old Testament uh, you know, uh, judgment on Israel. It says, Jesus, Jesus, after he had delivered the Israelites from Egypt, destroyed those who did not believe. That's Jesus. Uh, so, so we, I can talk about Jesus and his casting Jezebel on a bed of sickness in red letters in Re Revelation 2. And also it says, I will strike dead her followers. That's Jesus speaking. So I can go on and talk about other severe passages, but uh, hopefully that gives you a picture of how the, the, uh, the critics from within are you know, ignoring large swaths of scripture in order to have this textual God versus actual God sort of dichotomy. And it just doesn't work. In fact, I go through toward the end of the book and compare all of these texts that Greg Boyd is saying, oh, this is the, this is the textual God. That's not the actual God. This is what the t actual God would really do. Um, and then I'll, I actually look at other texts and say, nope, Greg Boyd is wrong here. Boom, 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 boom. And I, I, I show how at point after point, Greg Boyd has misrepresented things. Hmm. Okay, so how does somebody like Boyd, whether Boyd himself or those like Boyd, how do they avoid veering into heresy? For instance, I think the I, I, I think that it veers outside of orthodoxy if somebody claims that there is no final judgment. And I don't remember or I don't know what Boyd actually thinks about that. I I read other things that he says. And it sounds like, man, do you believe in final judgment? I, I would guess you might be a universalist. I don't know. No, Which he I would be a universalist. Is he yeah, a, a I don't know. I don't know if he's, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think he would hold to a, uh, a view of, uh, of, say, hell or final judgment uh, as being uh, a kind of conditional immortality, that uh, there'd be a cessation of existence. I think that's where Greg would lean. I, don't, I, I haven't seen his yeah. taking a, a universalist oh. turn. Right. But like if if you can't let your mind go to a place that God would ever judge anything on earth, then it follows you don't believe that he can judge in eternity. So it seems like it necessarily leads to that place. Now, if he says there's some kind of condition, my guess is he would maybe say, well, there's just a with I mean, like you said, there's there's a withdrawal, I, even a withdrawal right. is a judgment. So I don't know. It just. Sure. Yeah. Um, I just get nervous about this cruciform uh, hermeneutic because you start picking and choosing the Bible, then you start redefining who God is, and it's almost, uh, it, and then you start redefining final judgment, and maybe there's not a final judgment. Uh, 
I'm not necessarily putting that on Boyd because I haven't read him that he says that, but that is logically where it leads. And right. uh, I, I get concerned about that uh, be, because it, it's, again, it's just a picking and choosing. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, let me just you know, jump in with uh, with a few uh, maybe qualifying remarks. Uh, you know, you're right, Greg Boyd does talk about kind of this withdrawal that God withdraws His presence, withdraws His grace, and that human beings or demonic beings fill the void. But God doesn't actually directly bring judgment upon people. He doesn't strike people down like Uzza when he touched the ark or something. Uh, that uh, that that God doesn't do that sort of a thing. And so this is problematic. I'm not saying that God never withdraws. You know, God certainly does. But to say he only withdraws in judgment, but never actually directly, you know, never directly acts in judgment against someone, perhaps, you know, making that person sick or uh, striking that person dead. Uh, you know, what you see in the New Testament is you see that there are, I give an example of this in, in the book, where in Acts chapter 11, it says, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So the hand of the Lord, there's something positive. You know, we think of the kindness of God there. We read in chapter 13 uh, that the hand of the Lord strikes Elymas blind. So because he's resisting the gospel, he's interfering with uh, Sergius Paulus's interest in the gospel, uh, that he is struck by, you know, again, you know, Paul is filled with the Spirit. So it's not as though he's somehow, uh, or, you know, uh, he, that he's somehow going against the Spirit of God. No, he's filled with the Spirit. And he basically tells, you know, he strikes Elymas blind. So that's the hand, but that's the hand of the Lord. Uh, again, the severe, the severe hand of the Lord, the kind hand of the Lord. In chapter, right in between those two uh, chapters, you have chapter 12, where at the beginning, Peter's in prison, and it says that the angel of the Lord delivered Peter from prison. So positive use, you know, a reference to the angel of the Lord. At the end of that chapter, Herod, who is receiving glory uh, as though he's a god. It says that the angel of the Lord struck him down so that he died. Well, again, there's the kindness, deliverance from prison. There is the severity, striking him dead. Uh, and, and you see that sort of a theme going here. To, and so to say, oh, God simply withdrew his presence. It just doesn't account for so many of the judgments that we see both in the Old as well as the New Testaments. We see that there's a continuity of both kindness and severity. And uh, I think Greg Boy just you know, wants to push those things to the side and, uh, and, and I think fails to acknowledge that even in the wrath of God, there is a love that is being displayed. In fact, N.T. Wright said that if God is, you know, if God is not wrathful, then God is not loving. Uh, that uh, you know, yet a lot of people will just see these as opposed to each other. And Greg Boyd does give very much that strong impression that uh, that that wrath and love are antithetical to each other. But actually, wrath shows divine concern that God is going to act on behalf of his name, on behalf of the truth of the gospel. He's going to act on behalf of those who are being oppressed and tyrannized and so forth. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, would you maybe take a moment and unpack the, the the use of violence in the Old Testament? In particular, I'm thinking of how you, you talked about Hamas in your book, and then the kind of violence of God in the Old Testament, how those things are not equated as one and the same? Right. Yeah, I, I point out that the term used for violence, Hamas, uh, in the Old Testament is not ascribed to God. Uh, that's to human beings who are acting wickedly, unjustly, who are oppressing and so forth. So that is the that is locating where injustice is, you know, use that term Hamas. Now, God will respond to that by bringing severe judgment against people, but that is not called violence. That is, I mean, some people have used the term counter violence, uh, but again, that term it's of violence is not ascribed to God. It's not as though he's acting in violence against those who are acting violently, but it is seen as God's just action against those who are dehumanizing, oppressing, and so forth. So, so I, I do make that uh, distinction that, that is there. And I think it's helpful to keep that in mind that, uh, you know, when you talk about the, the violence of the God of the Old Testament, well, uh, not technically 
uh, in, in that category because violence is reserved for those who are acting tyrannically, oppressing, dehumanizing, and so forth. Hmm. What would you say if somebody says, yeah, but in Revelation 19, you have Jesus riding on a white horse and he's got a sword and he's got blood on his garment and he's about to go wreck shop on everybody. What would you say to somebody who pushes back with that? Well, I, I would say that there is that same application that what Jesus is doing is that he is bringing judgment on a wicked world. It's not as though he is... Uh, in a sense, trying to get in on the violence, he is actually responding as a just judge to the wickedness of human beings who continue to oppress. And, and as we read the descriptions of Babylon, uh, that Babylon is acting tyrannically. It is the one who, it is the, the city that oppresses others, that, uh, that enslaves and treats human beings as cargo uh, in the slave trade, and uh, that is basically living in luxury while other people are being oppressed through those uh, pursuits of, uh, of wealth and luxury and so forth. So, so that's to be understood. Now, some people like Greg Boyd will say, oh, the book of Revelation uh, is, is basically just using this, quote, violence metaphorically, or it's using this coercive force in, in metaphorical terms. And the problem here is, is that if you just say, kind of trying to tamp down revelation because it's using high degrees of symbolism or metaphor to talk about divine severity, it still doesn't take away the terror, the harshness of that judgment. Uh, for example, in Revelation chapter six, these uh, you know these you know the you know the you know peoples who are in rebellion against God, you know slave or free kings and so forth, that they're crying for the rocks to fall upon them mm -hmm. because of what the great wrath of the Lamb. Uh, again, right. the the Lamb is not just a sacrificial Lamb, but also a wrathful Lamb, kind of like the Maccabean brothers in, during the intertestamental period were described in First Enoch as being horned lambs uh, who are acting, you know, to to try to 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 bring restoration to their land from the tyrant that has come in, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, to to restore the land and to throw out the the despot uh, who is uh, who has who has um, desecrated the temple and so forth. So so again that. Revelation is picking up on that kind of language of the severe, the severity of the wrath of the Lamb, and there is terror there, there is fear, and so uh, you know, metaphor isn't going to you know just oh that easily takes care of the fear, the right. severity, and so like, forth. No, like it does what's not it a do that. Of? Like le Jesus having a, a giant sword and coming to make war with his armies is a symbol that he's like a fluffy Care Bear, like you know, like yeah, yeah. If, and it if doesn't we're even say have it's the symbolic. Same. It's symbolic of something, and it's yeah. clearly symbolic of judgment because he comes yeah. to judge and make war. Is what it says. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Greg Boyd would say, "Well, of course, he just speaks, and you know, you know with a sword of front coming from his mouth, and and the enemies are done away with. That they're they're gone. But but that seems to me like it is a direct action against them, not simply." Uh, withdrawing his presence, but he is act, being active in judgment, just like he is in Jude 5, where it says Jesus, like I said before, Jesus, after he had delivered the Israelites from Egypt, destroyed those who did not believe. So that's the kind of scenario that we have going on here. And uh, we, you know, and I, I like to quote C.S. Lewis on this in the Chronicles of Narnia, that Jesus, like this Aslan figure, you know, he's, he's good, but he's not safe. Yeah, could you maybe uh, unpack another section of your book where you talked about the the hermeneutic of our critics from within would like to say that there's a difference, or not that there's a difference, that there's actually a similarity between you have heard it said and you have heard it written, and they kind of conflate these two things, and that's one of the ways they're able to pit Moses against mm -hmm. Jesus. Could you maybe weigh into that for us? Sure, yeah. This is a most unfortunate uh, hermeneutical uh, distortion uh, because in uh, chapters five through seven, Greg Boyd says, well, Jesus is, quote, repudiating the law of Moses, that he is uh, challenging the law of Moses. But what Jesus is actually doing is he is challenging a misuse of the law of Moses. Uh, for example, the lex talionis, you know, you've heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Uh, and then Jesus talks about turning the other cheek and so forth. And, and uh, you know, well, the lex talionis was basically a law of proportionality. 
it's, it's basically articulated in what's seen in both testaments that God is going to render to everyone according to his deeds. And in a legal p- penal system, to give what someone deserves proportional to what that person had done is very fitting. But it was used by Jesus' contemporaries for personal vendettas. You know, if you did this to me, I'm going to get, get you back. I'm gonna, you know, it's going to be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And, and, and so Jesus is seen as someone who is repudiating all uh, swearing uh, or vows you know, and, you know, that let your yes be yes and your no be no. Well, what the kind of uh, law that, you know, that, you know, Jesus is not repeating oaths or vows in the Old Testament. What he is doing is he is speaking out against, and we see it illustrated in Matthew 5, as well as Matthew 23, where you say, oh, I didn't swear by the temple. I swore by the gold of the temple. Or, you know, uh, you know and, and so that makes my vow binding. But if I swear by the temple that I'm not bound by that. And so what Jesus is doing is he is saying, knock it off. Don't use this particularistic, casuistic uh, oath taking in order to evade keeping your promises or telling the truth. It actually is working in the opposite way than what it was intended to do. And so Jesus is speaking out against that. But Greg Boyd says, no, Jesus repudiated all those vows and oaths that the, that the law of Moses was talking about. Not at all. We see in the New Testament, God is making oaths. God is making vows that the New Testament talks about the oath you know, in, in Zechariah's song at the end of Luke chapter one. You know, the, the, the oath that he swore to Abraham. Uh, you know, we see that or, or God, you know, you know in, the, in the book of um, Hebrews, you know, that, you know, that there is this oath. That, you know, that, that God has made. He can't swear by anything higher than himself, so he swears by his own name. Well, is that of the devil? Is that of the evil one? You know, again, Greg Boyd is being very selective, and what he's trying to do is add c- c- to that idea that Jesus is repudiating those things in the Old Testament, that Moses is being put into this negative light. But when you look at the Old Testament as well as the New, Moses is one who is faithful in all of God's house. He is one, you know, and in fact, the, the, rule, the leaders of Israel are, you know, we, we see that they sit in the seat of Moses and, and, and Jesus says, do what they say, those who sit in the seat of Moses, but don't do what they do. Moses is one who is still held in high esteem. When it comes to that whole idea of, you know, you've heard it said, but I say to you, keep, keep in mind that just before in chapter four in Matthew, Jesus is repeatedly, repeatedly saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. Not Satan, you have heard it said, but I say to you, mm-hmm. he's saying it is written, it is written, it is written. And Jesus is challenging in chapter five, all of these misuses of the law of Moses, love your friends, you know, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Again, a misuse of what the Old Testament is saying. So over and over again, Jesus is attacking that abuse of the interpretation, but he's not attacking Moses himself. And, and so it's just, Jesus is often quoting from the law of Moses, holding it as authoritative. You know, the law of Moses said first in Matthew 15, again, talking about capital punishment, that this is the commandment of the Lord and so forth. Jesus is not diminishing it. And what you see in the New Testament is that the New Testament writers are not downplaying or dismissing the law of Moses. In fact, Paul says that the law in Romans 7, that the law is good and spiritual and holy. He doesn't take that attitude that Greg Boyd says. No, a lot of that is just kind of you know, inferior kind of stuff that needs to be jettisoned. We need to be, you know, be done with that. Jesus repudiated all that. No, we, we do not see that picture at all. So what I'm trying to do is adopt a hermeneutic that resembles, as closely as I can, that resembles what Jesus and the authorities of the New Testament were doing. And when you do that, you see that they are balancing the kindness and the severity of God here, that they are holding this intention. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Robertson McQuilkin, you know, the late Robertson McQuilkin used to say that it's easier to go to a consistent extreme than to stay at the center of biblical tension. And what I'm trying to do is hold a lot of these things in tension rather than going to one extreme or the other, like the critics from without the church, like the new atheists, or the critics from within the church, like Greg Boyd and others. Okay. Uh, I want to 
come back to one of the we've addressed a lot of the critics from within let's talk about one of the new atheists and we're pretty close to time to finish here so this will be one of our last questions but uh so richard dawkins here's a quote he says uh about the command to kill canaanites he says the bible story and he specifically references jericho which is of special interest i think to me in this case because one of the things that you had said was uh, that they were mostly attacked, these commands to kill. I, I think my interpretation of what you're saying was they were mostly focused on military bases. Jericho seems to have been an entire city, not just a military base. And that's the one that he goes after. And that's the one that new atheists usually go after, Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, here's his quote. He says, the Bible's story of Joshua's destruction of Jericho and the evasion of the promised land in general is morally indistinguishable from Hitler's invasion of Poland. The Bible is not the sort of book you should give your children to form their morals. Joshua's action was a deed of barbaric genocide. Now, I've heard Christians try to explain Jericho and other stories in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Michael Heiser uh, talked about, well, they, they were getting rid of the Nephilim. The Nephilim were mm -hmm. out and about. And so the, can the genocide had to do with like ridding the earth of these evil beings that were going to corrupt all of civilization. Uh, we met with Dr. Walton. He said, well, harem means to basically put out of use. They were chasing the Canaanites away, not really killing them uh, for the most part. And I think that's, uh, and, there, there's a large part to that. Yeah, go ahead. Right, go ahead. right. Um, others have said, well, but the Canaanites were especially evil. And what we found in archaeology is these, the lewdness of their sex act and they're just sheer barbarism and just cr evil. Mm -hmm. uh, they just, mm -hmm. we just need to get rid of them. Then, uh, then... <laughs> I mean, that's a crude way of putting it, but essentially. And, and then uh, I heard you say, I think maybe a little bit of agreement with Walton on the harem and chasing away mm -hmm. some agreement there. You had a few answers. One of them, they were largely not civilian populations and so on. Mm -hmm. right. So I've heard these various answers. Um, I'd love to hear you respond to Dawkins' charge specifically as it relates to Jericho. And I'm curious mm -hmm. if you kind of believe a little bit of each of these is right or not. yeah yeah i'm not i'm not the the heiser nephilim sort of a, a proponent um but uh, i will say that like like i said these are typically administrative uh, or military centers uh, of strategic importance where you don't have a civilian population. Even though it uses terms like man, woman, young and old and so forth, that just wasn't what these cities were about. And as you look at the pottery and so forth, you see that uh, this was kind of functional pottery rather than status pottery. And, and Richard Hess goes into a lot of detail on that. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the command is largely to drive them out. If you've driven them out, then you've done your job. And uh, and so if you've driven them out, then you are, and again, keep in mind that only three cities were literally destroyed, Jericho, Ai, and Hatsor uh, in the north, that these were the three cities that were, quote, utterly destroyed, but all the other ones were left intact. And the Lord told the Israelites that you would go into these cities that you have not built, that you would live in homes that you did not build and you know re e enjoy the fruit of trees that you did not plant and so forth. Uh, you also have a you know a picture of yes a people who are driving out those who are engaged in infant sacrifice uh, incest bestiality and ritual prostitution actually be considered criminal in any civilized society and this is far different from uh, from Hitler invading Poland I mean think of the the asymmetry here uh, the Polish people practicing lewd sex acts, uh, practicing infant sacrifice and so forth, hardly. Uh, the the uh, Israelites were told that they, you know, get through Abraham, they knew they had to wait until the sin of the Amorites had been reached, had reached full measure. So there's the waiting of over half a millennium before the Israelites would actually come in and drive out the Canaanites. Uh, another point is that the Israelites you know, should not be seen as those who are invading a place because the you know that these Canaanites are just these hapless people who just are defenseless. The Israelites were the ones who are disadvantaged. The Lord told them, "You're going to go. You know, these cities are going to be large and powerful. Uh, that you are going to be outnumbered." Uh, the people, you know, they look like, you know, giants, you know, you, you'll feel like, you know, they, we feel like grasshoppers in their sight and so forth. 
this was something that would arouse fear. And as John Golden Gate, the Old Testament scholar says, that going into this sort of a scenario was, can you hear me okay? I think I've yeah, you're frozen getting, here. Uh... Disrupting percent. it a little bit. Uh, you, you said uh, Golden Gate was the last thing I heard from you. Okay. And he's out, guys. Well, we're right at the hour mark. So uh, that <laughs> wow. is kind of a bummer. I wonder if his computer died because that looked like the it was having a hard time processing there for a little bit. But it's literally five o'clock. I mean, it's right he at had five about, o'clock. He, he was like not more a sentences. second later can i talk to these guys at remnant radio no i just i just i just uh, he's well, like I am watching this later. thank you so much for coming on i'm done uh, <laughs> go, go he ahead. said this I is am. probably our last question i don't care if josh had another one it's over um <laughs> that it really was a great interview i would really encourage you guys uh, check out paul's books uh uh is god a, a moral monster uh is god a, a vengeful bully um he's got some fantastic work specifically on uh canaanite extinction specifically on slavery in the old testament lots of really great uh content that that he's engaging with and this is something that i think um as was stated earlier it needs to be engaged with uh, because we have atheists on the outside telling the world that christianity is immoral and then we have christians on the inside telling people they can't believe and trust their bibles uh, because you know that was just someone's interpretation of what was happening and not really the god of the bible and i think paul does a fantastic job engaging with the text of scripture showing what the text of scripture actually means uh, what it's saying uh, but at the same time uh, not acquiescing to this idea that God doesn't have right. any vengeance, God doesn't have any judgment, that God is not moral by stepping into creation and and rightly administering justice in the moments that he sees fit. So uh, I'm yeah. super thankful for and, uh, Paul's work. I'm working through Habakkuk right now um, and the nations, you know, in chapter two, starting in verse six, it's actually the nations that are the ones that are crying out judgments against Babylon. God's raising up prophets from among the nations to declare these things. And these are the very things that they're declaring sin against idolatry. Yeah sexual immorality, uh, uh, these kind of predatory lending system, um, you know, getting drunk, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, making, uh, shedding blood for profit. These are the things that the nations are actually crying out to Babylon with great woes saying that your time has come, you're going to end in destruction. Uh, and it would be right and fitting for God to step in judgment and administer justice to a nation where to grow up in that nation is to be oppressed, but then to grow up to be the oppressor. Um, anyway, I, I think that that's part of uh, our Western context and our Western worldview that blinds us to the text of scripture. We live in a world and a society where um, uh, SA offenders, I have to say that because of YouTube, uh, but offenders of small children, these, these criminals, they get slaps on the wrist, you know, and in the Bible, you commit and act like that, you get put to death. So, you know, we live in a world where there aren't consequences for heinous and evil sins. We're slaughtering innocent, unborn children uh, by the droves, millions of them. And, and to think that you know, uh, we are going to have some kind of moral high ground and tell God what's just and unjust. It is absolutely obtuse. And I think it's because we live in a day where murder is okay. We live in a day where th this kind of immorality is just acceptable. The idea of a God that brings judgment against those things. I think it really has more to do with um, our sinfulness and our willingness to, to create God in our image than us submitting to God's justice and saying it's right and fitting for you to do what you will. Um, anyway, yeah. so those are my two cents on that show. Michael, do you have any kind of uh, closing thoughts before we wrap this thing up? Yeah, I just want to encourage our people that uh, there's anyone viewing this, listen to this, that uh, just to be real careful with people who call into question the scripture and i'm talking we expect that from the world we expect the world not to believe but the people who are like i'm a christian i'm a pastor and i love the bible but then they try to tell you well what's said in red letters is what really matters and well jesus never talked about this subject so this subject doesn't matter or well that was old testament and that was vengeful god old testament but this is new testament and they try to like pick and choose from the bible and uh, and one of the common ones that I'm seeing today is that, well, like, and he mentioned this of Boyd, but I've also read it in, in Pete Enns, uh, 
and uh, others where it's just basically, well, the Old Testament was just basically like, yeah, it's God's word, but it's it's really more like God's kids' words about God according to their ancient understanding. And then they try to use their high scholarly sophistication to to try to show like, hey, the way they talk about God is the way the pagans talked about the pagan gods and so on. Like, this warrior God, like, and so they they start talking about that. But the best way to understand, like, how do how should we interpret the Old Testament? Is we want to go to the apostles and say, how did they understand it? Because if I believe in a risen Christ, why do I believe in a risen Christ? Well, I mean, we we can go to, through all the like uh, apologetic evidence. We can we can also say, well, the you know the the apostles wrote it down. It's according to the scriptures. All this. Uh, but the apostles interpreted the Old Testament like this. I'm actually preaching on Matthew chapter one this week, uh, where it says, and this fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah spoke, but the Lord spoke. Or there's Acts chapter one, verse 16, the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David. And all throughout the Old Testament, it will interchangeably say the Lord said, the Holy Spirit said, David said, Isaiah said, the way that the New Testament authors viewed the Old Testament is that it was God's word, not that it was just God's kids' words about God that was just a little messed up. And so, uh, and so, I just want to encourage our viewers: don't don't fall for that. Like, hey, we, we need to uh, sort of pick and choose from the Bible or anything like that. I, I think the place that you end up is in a place of heresy because you basically redefine who God is, and it ends up not being. The God as historically defined by the church and um, and, uh, and I by think scripture. I I don't see your video camera yet, uh, Doctor Copan. Ah, there he is. Ah, Did your computer he die? came back? He came back. Did you did your computer die, Doctor Copan? Your, it says guest has muted themselves, so I don't know if you can unmute yourself if you can hear me. This is like one of those movies where like if you hang... where it's like, do I end the broadcast? Because we're kind of there. Uh, is... Here he goes. It says they muted themselves. He is currently trying to unmute himself. He is looking. He is looking. Well, what I what so, I was gonna this is, say, guys, this is the blessings of doing yeah. live streams. Okay, like you get the raw, uncut, unfiltered stuff. Uh, but that sometimes comes with technical difficulties, which is okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it since I see that Dr. Copan still looks muted. Is what my system is saying. And he looks wonderful, but unless he can interpretive dance some closing thoughts or mime me something, it might not work. So uh, anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. Uh, if you want to stay tuned with other episodes like this, or maybe the next time we have Dr. Copan on, uh, I would encourage you very much to subscribe to the channel. And more than anything, check out the newsletter so you can get updates uh, for all of the shows that we're coming out with and all the different pieces of content that we're developing. We finished a study guide on the first five parts of our Responding to Cessationism. Uh, that has been released to everyone. So if you're interested in that, all you have to do is subscribe to that newsletter, and then you can get that update as well. Um, um, but without further ado, uh, we want to thank you so much for watching this episode of Remnant Radio, and we'll talk to you next week. Uh, we'll be next week, tomorrow, not tomorrow, Wednesday. Got a lot of videos that we're going to be taping here soon uh, on Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Blessings, guys.